Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, I'm Maddie Martin. I'm the Head of Growth and Education at Smith AI. We are a virtual receptionist and website chat service for small businesses, primarily law firms. So today's topic is all about systems for law firm success. And we just had outrageous interest in this topic. I'm super excited for Carrie to be presenting today on something that is just near and dear to her heart. She works on this every single day with law firms. And I love that she shared uh, this quote in the invitation, if you got that, um, from the E-Myth Revisited, which is let systems run the business and people run the systems. I love that. So what you'll learn today is how to improve lead quality, how to drive down acquisition costs, how to eliminate overwhelming work stress, and how to maintain an excellent reputation focused on the role that systems play in all of those things. So without further ado, Carrie, welcome. Please thank you, introduce Maddie. yourself to the group. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Great to be here today. Thank you all for having me. I'm in sunny Richmond, Virginia today. Uh, it's uh, cold enough for me to stay a little further south of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, and systems are uh, ever more important in the day and age we're living in. Um, as that little bio put it, I'm uh, running a business, uh, ra raising a family. Uh, Maddie and I just had the conversation about puppies. We added a pandemic puppy over the, uh, over the quarantine period. So having a process and a system is super important. I will tell you, which is why it's kind of funny when you make that introduction, I am passionate about it and love these systems that we're building, but it is not a natural state for me. I am um, more creative and expressive than I am uh, process driven. And yet I will share with everyone and, and may want to add this one in the chat, Maddie, uh, Atomic Habits by James Clear made a brilliant point to me that has really resonated. Uh, for someone who, like me, is not necessarily highly process driven, uh, having systems and procedures actually frees up a lot of mental space so that you can get to the things that you want to invest that creative energy into. So uh, for me, getting dressed is one of those crazy moments of my day. And if I know I don't have a lot of time, I go to the black turtleneck and I'm good to go. It's a system. Uh, what I do every time I pick up the mail is a system. And those are the little things that keep order in chaos. And I think that that's really what this is all about. Uh, we know, especially in the legal industry, that there is a lot of overwhelm. The demands are intense. The, the field is tight. Uh, and anything we can do to really help people feel very much in control and on top of things will add to their success. So that is what we're going to dive into today. Awesome. All right. Well, All right. I'm going to throw a screen up here. Awesome. All right. Give me one second, everybody. Sorry. Picking up midway. I do want to preempt this by saying I have a demo of, uh, of one of our systems that I'm going to share with you today. And it is 99% um, demo name, uh, fake names and whatnot. But I did uh, put it, <laughs> block it out. But if, they, if anything slipped through, it is fake names. So I don't actually work with Justin Bieber. Um, so he's just in there. All right. So let's, uh, let's talk about that. Sys let systems uh, run the business and people run the systems. And that is super important right now. I think this is a great conversation to be having. Uh, the legal industry isn't particularly well known for being early adopters, uh, but the pandemic really forced us to revisit how, how, our, how our firms run, what kind of uh, systems we have in place and how those can be improved upon to operate in virtual settings, in different, uh, in, in non-contained areas. So um, having those systems in place and letting people oversee those systems is going to be a means of limiting liability. Um, and of course, attorneys know a lot about liability. So you're always looking for ways to foolproof your business and having systems in place that the humans simply oversee is going to be a great way to do that. So uh, Maddie, as you kind of introduced, we're going to talk about what systems mean today, um, determine where those should be implemented, and then we'll take a look specifically into um, the three systems that, that my team works uh, specifically on. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kerry James. Uh, James and I work with law firms in a consulting capacity to build their systems for 
intake, mar uh, excuse me, marketing intake and client service. And so it's our job to evaluate how best to use technology and people to create systems that, again, uh, create safety nets and produce fantastic outcomes for our clients. Um, this is a moment where we are creating exceptionally modern systems, utilizing AI, uh, turning to trusted partners, realizing where we can outsource. And, and this is an area where I think law firms are quickly catching up. I don't think they really had the choice. We you know, saw the writing on the wall in those 2018-2019 uh, reports about stress in the industry. Uh, and I think that technology and companies like Smith have really risen to the occasion of, uh, of, of providing solutions for law firms so that they can function in a modern way that helps alleviate some of that overwhelm. And when we can effectively do that, we really have means for a sustainable uh, long-term success for a firm. And so we'll see what it takes to get there. All right, so when we talk about systems, we'll just go all the way to the 30,000 foot view here for a second. And systems are those interconnected interconnected frameworks of procedures uh, utilizing technology and people. So in some cases, it's people doing the work. In some cases, it's technology doing the work. The business is that holistic body of systems, and they affect each other. And I think that that's one of the most important things we need to consider when we talk about systems. What I do in my little piece of the business has an impact on what James does on, in his piece of the business. So when we stop to consider building a system, we need to think of the technology and tools that we need as well as its place within the uh, overarching areas of the business. So today we'll focus um, more on intake marketing and client service as those are the areas where uh, Carrie James focuses. Now, why we need to have systems is, uh, is a, a great conversation uh, every firm should be having. When you think about uh, the success of franchises like McDonald's or Chick-fil-A, if you're in the South, I'm not sure if it's all the way up there in Buffalo. Do you have Chick-fil-A, Maddie? We have one. Oh, wow. Well, you're it's missing out. Year. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Um, these the franchises are built on systems. If you've seen even that... Um, that McDonald's movie, uh, I can't, the founder, uh, they're, they're, the whole concept behind McDonald's was that every burger gets exactly two pickles. And whether you ordered that burger in Buffalo, New York, or Richmond, Virginia, you were going to get the exact same thing. And that consistency is imperative to your brand. Your brand uh, has, uh, you have to have that message delivered time and time again, and systems ensure that consistency. So your brand has systems, you know, using the same font, using the same colors. That is a system for brand management. So you want to create reliable, repeatable, predictable outcomes, and systems are going to ensure that you do that. Again, anything that can uh, that we can wrap our brains around and give our team an actual procedure is going to eliminate the overwhelm that is just too common in this industry. So, of course, that's really important. Efficiency is always going to be an outcome when it comes to creating systems, and efficiency is going to enhance profitability. Uh, efficiency is going to ensure that your company can achieve more. And your employees, if they're not overwhelmed, they're happier, they provide better service. All of these things add up to a better bottom line. And at the end of the day, you know, that's what everyone's really working towards. So if we can create a system around it, we want to. However, I'm going to put some, some big red flags here. Do not create a system for everything. Uh, I was reading an article last week about systems, and this one firm owner had mentioned a system for using the restrooms. And yes, he's got a great firm, and he you know, really believes in, in, in systems to, to power that firm forward. But we also need to be mindful that we are running humans. Uh, we can't exactly have a system for everything. So balance your need for control and OCD with the need to be human and present in your business. Don't dilute sort of the meaning of a system and the value of a system by applying it, you know, to uh, you know, liberally. Yes, we want to make, make good choices. And, and we'll give you some pointers for, for determining when you need to implement a system. And we're going to make it very simple. Just three very basic questions to ask yourself. 
Is this a, a task that comes up repeatedly? So in the case of intake or onboarding or offboarding or hiring, those are things that you need systems for. They're going to happen time and time again. If you know that when this event comes up, I turn to page 14 of my, of my firm manual and it tells me exactly how to do this, fantastic. I just freed up all that mental space to be more creative and effective. Um, does this task take more than five minutes? You don't want a checklist for something as simple as hanging up the new monthly calendar. So does it take a little bit more time? And is my time well spent here or should this be systemized and perhaps delegated or outsourced? Okay, and, and that's where I really feel like building in systems with Smith or technology like Loop, which we'll talk about a bit later, th this is where we really find that we can optimize our time and talent to be utilized in the way most productive to the firm. And I actually, I'm, I'm excited to show you something on that. So does this happen repeatedly? If, and I'm sure, you know, if you're sitting here in this, in this um, audience right now, you likely have your intake system. Maybe it needs improvements and we'll certainly share ideas for how to do that. But if you're not sure you need um, a system, then I encourage you to go right now, well, maybe not right now, a little later, and look at your reviews. And if you have things that have come up repeatedly in your negative reviews or your less favorable reviews, then that's something you might want to systemize. So if people are saying repeatedly, they never call me, but they never call me back, well, maybe we need to add some outsourced um, virtual receptionists. If the feedback is there's not enough communication, well, then we need to talk to our team about what that communication system looks like. So starting with the negative reviews, which I always say, Maddie, and this is you know back from my instructor teacher days, there's a good side to bad behavior. And that tells us where we can make improvements. And if we're all in this state of constant improvement, then we want to ensure that we know where we have opportunity to improve. So now, one thing, Carrie, there I will also say for, for anyone who's listening, watching this, thinking to themselves, I don't have any negative reviews or I seldom have negative reviews. Ask your staff, ask your friends and peers who know a little bit about how your firm works, ask your contractors because they're actually probably the closest to Sort of the, the system gaps that often happen and the gaps in training that would be there for staff, but not for contractors. So mm -hmm. digging a little bit deeper, if you're saying, you know, I don't have any negative reviews. Well, you know where to look and that's not an excuse. Well, and even if you, you know, in, in the concept of, of in, in the context of intake in particular, you know, if there's a case that you wanted to sign and you didn't, you know, having that conversation kind of like that little exit survey. So I understand mm -hmm. you went with another attorney. Tell me, uh, you know, is, is there something we could have done better? And I think it's always in how we frame the question to really help drive productive, constructive criticism, if you will. So. And if you're only asking for, you know, what's what's the star rating and a comment based on that star rating, you could even for those clients who give you five star reviews say, if there was anything we're begging you, like give us some constructive feedback you'll get it if you specifically ask for it. Now, you don't have to ask for it in the process of getting a Google review because you might not want <laughs> right. that to the world, but you can have a process internally of getting that feedback um, if you're asking for net promoter scores and things like that. Yes, and that, that is a big one. I know you've done um, a lot on, on reviews and there's great resources with Smith on the review side of things, but that's an important one is, you know, folks, understandably, when it comes to collecting reviews, they go to people who they are confident are going to give them positive reviews, but we don't learn from those. So making a point of actually picking up the phone with that disgruntled client and saying, I really want to make sure that whatever didn't go well is something that we can avoid in the future. And that's a basic one. So jot this one down. If you don't have a a system for responding to negative reviews, um, then I think there's a webinar over at Smith for that as well. We do. So. We have a great one. Check out, you know, the video. It's on our YouTube channel. So excellent. Um, well, and then does this take more than five minutes? Um, you know, attorneys are are very time conscious. They have to be for folks who are working on the billable hour. So if this is something that isn't a great use of your time, um, it needs a system and that system probably doesn't sit in your lap. So you may have to step in to figure out that system to get that system in place, document it. Uh, but you probably don't need to be the one doing it. 
And again, as someone who doesn't uh, consider high, high structured processes my natural state, knowing who to give the systems to so that they do end up well done uh, is super important for me. And I'm sure I'm not the only one out there. So knowing what your, what your time is worth and making sure that your time is spent doing things that move the needle. So to that uh, extent, I wanna, yeah, if this is- Before, please. like if you go back one slide, I, I really also wanna emphasize, I know that we're looking at this as like delegate once you have the system, but sometimes think about your paralegals, maybe folks who are helping you with different tech implementations or marketing programs, operations, billing, you might have someone who's much better at setting up the systems. You can delegate that system set up to them. You don't have to delegate once the system is set up. Absolutely. So I really want to emphasize that there. It's and not that the burden just on you. Absolutely. And that goes to knowing your strengths. Um, we're working with clients right now who are, are pretty clear. They don't have it figured out yet. And they'd rather work with someone like, like Carrie James, who has built those systems in other places to say, all right, make this better because we don't like it the way it is. So mm -hmm. again, always back to recognizing uh, your strengths and weaknesses. And, you know, there, there's a, a great line again from education that, you know, we spend in, in American education in particular so much time remediating our weaknesses you know, spending time trying to get better at systems, that's not the way business works. You know, that's what we did, did in school and it, it may not be the best place there either. Spend time amplifying your strengths, give someone else the things that slow you down and take you away from, from your most productive work. And, and that's what I wanted to introduce here. And I know th this is even a system in and of itself. This is Michael Hyatt's uh, Focus Compass. And I absolutely love this because I, you know, especially as, a, as a, an entrepreneur attorney um, for, for people who are building businesses like we are, if you stop and, and, and evaluate whether you are in the right place in your business, you'll find that a lot of those things that are systemized do need to be taken off your plate. And like you said, Maddie, from figuring out the system to implementing it, to utilizing it, that may not, none of those may fall under your jurisdiction. Um, in fact, I'll give a shout out to Jamie over at Smith. She worked with us on implementing a, a chat playbook that she had way better answers than we had because she'd done it time and time before. So turning to the people who know, who, uh, who are good at that is going to be a good use of everyone's time. So Michael Hyatt puts it like this, you are either passionate or dispassionate, proficient or not proficient. You either are uh, loving something, it's in your desire zone, or you hate something, it's in your drudgery zone. Everything that's not in those two extremes is just distraction and, dis and disinterest. So when you stop and say, okay, I love writing for my firm blog, um, but it's you know taking me an hour and a half of billable time, I'm not very good at, I, 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 I'm, I'm not bad at it, but I, I, you know, I'm sure someone else could do it, but I love doing it. Well, that's a distraction. You love doing it, but it's not the best use of your time. Your time may be better spent in the desire zone where you do things efficiently and they move the needle for your business. So take a screenshot on this one, guys. This is a great little visual to ask yourself, where does this belong? Um, and then I got to, you know, dig James out of spreadsheets because those are in his desire zone. All right. So again, back to those three questions, you know, do we need to implement a system? If it's taking more than five minutes of your time to do a task repeatedly, it probably needs a system and it probably can be automated. And that's a really important part of the conversation to be having with regard to systems today versus 10 years ago. And especially when it comes to law firms today, i.e. post quarantine, when a lot of firms really did 10 years of catching up in the last 10 months um, because they realized that there were smarter ways to do things that took a lot of that drudgery zone work off our plates and put them into automated systems which create those foolproof uh, consistent outcomes. Okay, so the final thing you need to ask yourself when it comes to do we need a system is whose name is on the letterhead? If you aren't comfortable with every single thing that happens in your office, then you have every right to, to, to create a system around it. If you are ultimately responsible for the outcome, if your name is on the, on, on the building, on the letterhead, you are ultimately responsible for it. It's uh, your reputation on the line, it's, it's your business. And so consider the things that at the end of the day, you want to know are done 
with your name on it done well. Um, answering the telephone, responding to a complaint, uh, showing up in court. Think about the things that you clearly realize are a reflection on you. And uh, the larger your organization, the more important those systems become because there are a lot of people uh, wearing your logo. Okay. So now if we're going to, uh, if we've identified some areas where we need to implement a system, let's talk briefly about how we're going to do that. Like you said, this may not be you at all. So you may turn to your head of intake and say, Joe, Tell me the system start to finish. I want to know every little thing that you do that you do from the second our phone rings. That would be part of your intake system. So take inventory. Who are the people? Who are the tools? Who what are the tasks? And then capture it. And a lot of times this is better done with a show versus tell. Instead of just getting Joe to jot this down, have Joe do a screen capture. If you aren't using Loom, L O O M to record free videos to share with your team. Again, this is a good time to uh, put somebody on that task. Creating tutorials, videos, showing folks how you want things done so that they're done the same way every time is going to be a big part of creating a consistent, reliable system. If you, um, if you again, have a large group Ensuring that everyone does the same thing is especially important with data. You know, the age old garbage in, garbage out. When you are inputting data, making sure everyone is using the same, uh, the same keystrokes, the same data entry uh, points, those all are important. And the larger the group, the less likely you are to have consistency if you don't build systems around it. So use screen capture, take screenshots, whatever it is to show exactly how things need to be done. I just want to pipe in one thing here. Please. Karen. I think that, you know, so many of those who are with us today are in really, you know, small, solo maybe in small parts. And it's very easy to know it when you see it and not build a system because you're so comfortable asking all the right questions. They just flow from your tongue and you know exactly what to do when, when a new lead calls. It's very hard to sort of hold yourself accountable or you and a partner to hold each other accountable if it's just you or just the two of you. So if you feel like, man, I'm really in my groove, I know exactly what to do, or, or you know, I'm really in the groove with my paralegal or my partner, record your calls and at least do it that way or give that over to the paralegal or maybe to your partner who is yes. better suited to that sort of task because they enjoy that sort of thing. And but that's a have to dive into that. Yeah, that is a fantastic suggestion because when you are good at it or you're so in it, you don't always recognize what you're doing. So, you know, in, in the case of those calls, for example, you may not recognize that you you draw some connection with the person like, oh, I'm 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 I'm, I'm Kate from uh, from Akron. Oh gosh, I have an uncle in Akron. You know, just those little things that you don't even recognize you're doing. Someone else may be able to capture that when they listen in on it. So great, great, great uh, recommendation there. Definitely. Well, the only thing I will also say, just because I'm getting a couple of questions about it, is sure. that obviously if you're recording your calls, you have to tell people if you're in this sort of two-party state where you need to notify them. If you're in a one-party state, you know, then you're in a different situation. We actually have a blog post going up about that. But, oh. you know, it's not that hard to say, you know, do you mind if I record this call? This call is going to be recorded just for better note taking or whatever quality assurance. You can make it as corporate as you want. But Sure. You know, if you're in, in a state that requires disclosing that, my point simply is that A, you may already be doing that and you probably should if you can with call rail for your marketing sort of calls that are coming through, mm -hmm. but listen to those calls, not just to see, you know, how did that call go? Did I get that lead? Dig in a little bit deeper and say, do I ask the same questions every single time? Or even what are the questions that I ask that get me to more repeatable success with more qualified leads? And those are the questions that even if I'm not, I should be asking every time. Absolutely. No, you are asking all the right questions there. Um, and then, you know, again, if you're in it so much that you're not sure, there are, of course, templates and scripts out there that, you know, you, you can go digging for it. So if, you, if you're not uh, at the point or if you're, you know, thinking about going out on your own or something, um, there are starting points if you haven't really figured out your system just yet. 
um, no, don't always need to recreate the wheel. Uh, and I know I mentioned this earlier, but adding some context to it, where did the, what happened up to this point and where does it go from here? Um, when we work to train teams that have multiple levels of, of a system, um, we make sure that everybody has that conversation together at least once so that they know what you do here in this stage of the pipeline, for example, is going to affect someone else. So how do I need to how do I need to take that into account when I'm doing my work? That's really important. Um, document it, process maps again with the videos, templates. You know, get that playbook. Um, my dad was a, a, an operations director, and he always told me if there was one person that the business couldn't survive without, you got to get that person out because you can't have a business that sur that survives on one person. Everybody needs to be able to be expendable, uh, take vacation time, be unavailable. If you have somebody who your business can't function without, then you need a system um, for, for handling that person's great, job. Great point, Carrie. I mean, I, I want to make sure everyone understands that. Like what Carrie is saying in, in no bad way, that if you can't, if your firm can't survive without you, if you, if your firm can't survive without your paralegal or your intake specialist, if there's knowledge that's residing up here and it actually leaves with that person, you need to extract right. that, put it, document it, and make a system. Right. I think my dad was a little harsh to saying you need to get rid of that person, but get that person to get their system um, outlined for you. And again, back to don't task yourself with all of this, uh, attorneys. This is not your task, um, but it may be a task that's worth delegating to someone else. And it's it's uh, it can be quite a process, and you know it, it's going to be it's going to be a project. And then, of course, if you have a system, you need to train people on the system. It's irrelevant uh, if you don't have the buy-in. And then the same thing goes for the accountability. If you create these systems and you don't have checks and balances, then there's no point in the system. Um, as my husband always says, validate. Uh, you need to verify and validate. Um, trust but verify. And, and the other trust thing here is that it's really actually to your benefit to have systems because they might hold people accountable by default, right? Like there are plenty of systems that log the user behavior and the activities. So that is going to help you once you've implemented it, hold people accountable. They have Absolutely. a user profile. And people feel better about that. I mean, I, I, if you've ever not done your homework in life, you may have been lying in bed going, oh God, I hope I don't get caught. Nobody wants that feeling. So if you know you're being held accountable, you know you're going to hit the hit the mark because most people are good that way. So you're um, helping your team exactly. You're helping your team. You're creating. You, you, one of the one of the clients that we work with, uh, we were talking about the implementation of of our system, and uh, one of the gentlemen just said, "Oh, I just feel so much better every day. Like the overwhelm is gone. The fear that you didn't do something is gone. The worrying about being asked if it was done is gone." And any way that we can make our team feel better about their existence within the firm, you're, you're going to ensure that people stick around, you'll have the business continuity that's so important, and uh, serving happy clients, um, happy employees lead to happy clients, and vice versa. So we want to make sure that that's um, a big part of it. So I'm going to dive in a little bit deeper here on marketing intake and client service. Those are the systems that Carrie James works with. Any questions that we want to stop and chat about, Maddie? Uh, there's one main question that you can, you know, sort of tie it in wherever it makes sense for sure. you around which system to document first, and then also like system documents. Like if you've got a lot of documents at your law firm, how do you approach systems for them yeah. and in what order? And and that's again, I have just uh, the slide to show you on that one. So we will okay. get there. Um, and so much of this is very practice area specific. You know, there there's the right tool for for every for everything. I mean, truly, there is the right tool. Um, you know, when, with our tool, we completely custom build it so that it fits your system as opposed to trying to get your peg to fit that hole. So you can certainly go the custom build this, uh, route. And working with consultants who know the tools in that space is obviously well advised. Again, is it worth your time to explore the 22,000 
uh, different tools at your disposal or turning to a team that works with all of a great variety of tools and knows where to deploy which. Um, so it's very dependent on the practice area and specific to the firm's needs, in which case, you know, those custom solutions are really, um, really beneficial. So let's dive into marketing for a second. So your marketing system is your system of generating leads. You like that? We just went deep inside that, that little uh, bubble there. So how are you generating leads? If you are a law firm, you're not just sitting around waiting for someone to walk past your window or knock on your door. Uh, in this case, we, we've created a tiny little uh, map, a little process map of one little piece of the marketing system. This is an ad, a geofenced ad. And if you're not familiar with geofencing, geofencing uses satellite to actually create a boundary around a specific area. Uh, so let's say in this case, we have a geofenced medical center to attract injury clients. If somebody sees that ad, they have the option to either click to call or click and go to, to the website. We wanna think about every action that that individual can take once they get there. So if they click to call, you know, I could get a ton of, of clicks. Now this is important. This is where, you know, the, the age old argument that the leads all suck. Leads don't suck. Lawyers are busy. They don't get to them quickly. And then that person moves on. We don't engage the new lead fast enough. We miss them. So if you have a click to call, you want to make sure that that phone is being answered ideally by a live agent. And so in this little bit of a system, we have a client who has a geofenced ad and that click to call is going to Smith. Now, if they were to go to the website, they have a whole nother variety of options, conversion points. They may call again, speed to lead. The quality of the lead is very likely tied to the ability to get to that phone call. And if you look at the trend reports, law offices really are struggling with that one. So finding the right partners to answer the phones professionally, empathetically, and quickly is super important. Now, the same thing goes with forum fills, chats, and emails. You know, in the case of Smith getting to those leads quickly, you will see that your leads don't suck. It's the ability to get to them quickly. So having that in place is going to give us the option to engage quickly. The other thing is, you know, when we look at our client reports on marketing, we can see, oh, you know, fantastic, a 22% conversion rate. Well, it's a 22% conversion rate after Smith weeds out 162 wackadoos. So you want to make sure that when you are using the resources, the limited resources of your team, that you're deploying them well. If I'm going to spend time getting my intake team on the phone with someone, I want to be sure that it's someone that is likely to convert, like one in four. You know, I don't want my team to have to answer more than four phone calls before they sign a case. Thank you so for putting a number on that because I think that's super important. If you are looking at your systems, you're also looking at your benchmarks because systems sometimes have funnels like this. There might just be a workflow, but in this case, it really ends up being a funnel. This ends up being a funnel. Yeah. You what want to are make you sure. Yielding? Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you're right. So really think about that. If, if you uh, are, are looking at stats and you're saying, gosh, we're only closing one in 10, then you're keeping your staff too busy. Uh, and they probably need someone else to field the calls in the first place. Suddenly you'll say, wow, my leads are really good. It's because your partners over at Smith are taking care yes. of those lousy leads. All right, so the other thing is, again, engaging quickly when it comes to chat or form fills or emails, either having that outbound system in place where the second that lead comes in, somebody is on the phone taking care of that person, or at very least, if you're a smaller firm and you're not engaging somebody in full virtual receptionist services, at least you're halting their search process. 78% of, of, uh, of legal clients are starting their search online. They contact a firm. If you can just acknowledge that they've submitted a request and let them know we're looking over your, your inquiry and I'll have someone call you shortly, Jane. Well, now Jane feels like she doesn't have to keep looking. Somebody is there. Um, we call this speed to lead. You are a first responder in this case, and you're looking to take that person's burden off their chest and put it in your lap. So if you can't get there quickly, at least get that autoresponder in place and even better if you can get a, an actual live person on the phone. So now we've got this system, it, go, it goes through the funnel to the intake team and now what happens? 
this is where that context is super important. So now we're going to dive into intake a little bit, a little bit deeper. So intake is converting leads. So let's look, and, and again, we're, we're looking at one little piece of each system. So that little piece of the marketing system was a geofenced ad. This little piece of the marketing system now is an e-lead, a lead that's come through the website. Again, that auto acknowledge is going to halt the search process and buy us just enough time to say, we've received your inquiry. We're going to have someone on the team give you a call shortly. Now, if you're using an automated system, fantastic. That goes out the door and notifies someone to make that call, whether that's in-house or external. Buying your time, halting the process, hopefully getting someone on the phone. That, that's the outbound call. If that person isn't reached on that first try, what's your system? If I walked into any firm and said, how many times do you follow up with someone before you abandon that lead? They should have an answer. Well, we text three times, call twice and send an email when it's all over. Great. That should be the system for every single time. If you can't tell me exactly what your follow-up system is, you're losing cases. We've worked with firms that have been able just by implementing the follow-up system to increase their conversions by 50%. So it, it's, it's not a small amount of, of time, uh, of, uh, it's not a, a small uh, increase. It's substantial if you think a 50% increase on conversion rates. Same I, I amount of money. Too, totally. And, and actually in other presentations that we've done, we've sort of amassed a bunch of data from all these other tech companies that we work with. We see that, you know, you need six touch points across phone, email, text, whatever it is you're using to nurture and follow up, six touch points to go from like, you know, 49% confidence to like 93% confidence that you've exhausted all attempts with that lead and they have made a decision one way or the other. Well, and I, and I completely understand people sometimes feel like, oh, it's, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to annoy people. Everyone's kind of gotten used to this, um, this approach now. Uh, it, it works on me. I will tell you that I will get a call when I'm in the middle of a, of a presentation. It's not a good time to take a call. I ignore it. The next time I'm getting dinner on the table, I don't take it. The next time I'm walking the dog, it's a good time for me to take a call. So it's about meeting people where they are. And we're going to look at specifically what that follow-up sequence should look like, the, those six points at a minimum, to really convert. And, and let's all just get over ourselves for a second on the annoying thing. If, if you being able and willing and personalized and eager to help someone is annoying, that's okay. Let them go. You've done They'll your tell work. You no. Listen, I mean, if they don't tell you no, you have to assume that they appreciate your outreach because it was very likely an inbound inquiry that set up that chain of events. That's, you're absolutely right. That sounds like something James told me just this week. All right, so now once we get that person, uh, we, you know, we finally get through that follow-up and we move into the consultation. Well, do we have a system for ensuring that that consultation that has been booked is going to happen, that you're not going to be sitting on an, on an empty Zoom chat, that your meeting is not going to be held up for a half an hour because somebody's running late? So you want to make sure that you have, again, a system for ensuring that that consultation takes place. Do you send a reminder the day before? Do you get a confirmation? What do you do if they don't show? What's the system in place to rebook that client? Again, system, system, system. Same thing goes with the e-doc. If you are, if you're submitting an e-doc for a retainer and you, do you have a system for, excuse me, following up? Uh, if you haven't received it, it immediately, do you stay on the phone with that person? Do you get a notification when it's been delivered so that you can let the person know? Think about all these little steps. It will improve your number of signed cases. And then again, you need a system for getting that data into your CMS. Uh, you know, with our system, we, we push that data in so you're not having to take, again, someone's time to enter data that's already been entered into one system. So if you aren't familiar with, uh, with uh, Zapier, or you're not you're you're not using all your tech tools to make sure you're not doing anything with redundancy. Um, you do want to talk to someone to help you there. Just really take inventory on what you're doing, uh, and and really have someone take a look at it to save you a whole lot of time. And then of course, we put all this work into converting clients in this intake bubble. But how do we move them from a lead to a client 
and actually have that serve the company, the business, the firm well in the end. And that's where we move into client care. And if you don't have a system for client care, that, is a, it, that should be on your New Year's resolution list for 2021. All right, this is, I'm still in intake for a minute here, and I know I keep referencing our system. So Loop is our system. We built this specifically working with a very robust practice, a lot of overwhelm, a lot of people with different roles and tasks, and uh, not a lot of consistency for how those leads were being handled. Having something in place, uh, we're going we're gonna to dive into this follow-up sequence, like I said, because this is where we really have the opportunity to convert more cases, uh, excuse me, more leads. So in this case, a, uh, a client of ours has a call come in uh, or a lead come in, whether it's an inbound inquiry of some kind or a phone call, and the person who uh, the uh, intake specialist has that conversation. If that conversation goes well, we can move them into manual follow-up, or maybe we automatically send the e-document. You know, we, we build this system based on the firm's actual processes and certainly improving it where we can. But what if this inbound call came, uh, this inbound request came in and you don't get to the person right away and that phone call is unanswered? Well, now I can move them into a, an automated follow-up. And this is where the magic really happens. We're going to look a little bit more closely is into what happens there, right, in the auto follow-up. So this is the underlying system that everyone who wants to increase their conversions should be looking at today. We pick up the phone, we make that initial outreach. If we don't get that person, we trigger an automation sequence that reaches them on their phone, text them, let them know we've tried to reach them, keep it personal, keep it short, let them know that you're happy to chat, ask them a good time. If they respond, you'll be notified that they've said 2 p.m. on Tuesday. Great, book the consultation, initiate the follow-up sequence, get that client booked. Maybe they are a desk dweller, email is the easier way to reach them. So you wanna have a different means of follow-up in that case. One of the conversion points we are finding super effective right now, you've prob I'm going to tell you this and you're going to say, oh my gosh, that's happened to me. You look down and you see you've missed a phone call. Well, that's a ringless voicemail drop and it's your voice, the attorney saying, hi, this is Maddie Martin. I'm sorry I missed you. I tried to give you a call. Let me know a good time to reach you. I'd love to help you with your case. That feels personal and it's it's again, it's it's another means of communication with try text and email, leaving that ringless voicemail goes, gosh, she's really trying to get me. I better pick up the phone and call. Offer that booking link. You know, some people are certainly the younger people are very eager to just self-serve. So let them book into a calendar. That's been a huge conversion point on uh, on our, some of our clients' websites. If you haven't tried that, I really recommend it. Set a couple, you know, try it, put five open opportunities per week in your calendar that you leave open uh, where people can book directly. And then build into your system just that one last time to pick up the phone personally and make a phone call. Phone calls are still the highest way to convert a lead to a client. Any questions there, Maddie? Uh, what ringless voicemail drop solutions do you recommend? We have our own. So we build it into the system. Uh, anyone can record a simple uh, voicemail, uh, excuse me, voice memo uh, on their phone. I have our clients email it to us and we put it in their automation sequence. Super effective. Really recommend that one. Especially, you know, if you if you are a, an attorney with um, sort of name recognition, uh, somebody that, that the kids know the jingle on TV, that can be actually kind of exciting to get that phone call. <laughs> Let, let's go a little bit into uh, client service. And this is where I want you to step back from your business a second and think about the overarching goal of what you're trying to achieve here. This is where we create advocates. So we've got this new client just came through intake. How are we welcoming them? You know, we don't want to drop the ball here. If we were just so great at reaching out and following up and contacting that person until we were able to sign that case. We want to show that our uh, enthusiasm for working with them hasn't dwindled just because we have that retainer in place. So how do you welcome a client? How do you inform them of what to expect? I think this step here eliminates a whole lot of uh, 
less than positive feedback. Problems if, later on. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where you're grooming your clients. The best way to reach me is via email so that you're not burdening your staff with 72 phone calls during the day. So let folks know in very simple terms, I think we overcomplicate things so much. If you have a one page little sheet that, you know, spend the 25 bucks to send it to someone on Upwork to make it look really great for you. And that's part of your e-delivery five days after somebody signs a case. Wanted to thank you for joining our firm. Here's what you can expect over the next six to nine months, which is the average length of a case. So big that that's going to save you a lot of trouble down the road and it's going to make your your client feel heard different you know, formats too carrie you know like we've seen some clients send a link to a youtube video yes. uh, you know we have this like email and text follow-up after calls that we offer and and one of the things that we include there and i'm sure it's in your drips too that you've got you know here watch this link watch this video before your first consultation watch this video Brilliant. before your first meeting you know you can have different client stages addressed with different videos. So it's totally. a to watch, it's really relevant and it helps you meet them exactly where they are in that moment. Ooh, think about that one. If you're a criminal attorney and, and you're sending someone the, the what to expect the first day in court and you're sending that, you know that that goes out based on a date entered in your system. Mm -hmm. Feels personal, video, anytime you can integrate video into your uh, delivery systems here is a huge People win. don't read. You know, they people don't really read don't anymore. Read. Yeah, they don't so, read anymore. Not even you mentioned them. earlier the um, the net promoter score. Tell us what Smith is how Smith is helping with that. So we can actually do a lot of outbound calls um, for review requests based on where that client is in the life cycle. So if you're uh, completing work with them, we can uh, ask a few questions on the phone, including, you know, how likely are you to recommend our firm to a friend or family member? And that's really what net promoter means. Um, a score, I think of, you know, seven or higher, someone's going to correct me, um, <laughs> is makes you a promoter. And, and those are the people who then you want to follow up with and, and make sure that they are getting all of your newsletters that they know the latest about your firm, any new, you know, practice areas that you're moving into or exciting updates, invite them to, you know, become a, you know, member of your Facebook page, LinkedIn group, whatever it is, make sure that they're involved because they're going to be the most likely to refer those friends that they said they would. Yeah. And that referral piece is what I really want to talk about because again, remember, we're backing up here for what the long-term goal is. So you're, you're having people make those calls, if it's Smith or if it's internal, you're responding, it, you know, again, this is kind of heading off somebody who's going to go to Google to air their grievances before talking to someone on the staff. So have that system in place for responding to criticism if you get some. But here's the thing, you know, again, if you're a first responder, you're you're somebody that that takes the call uh, from somebody who's looking for legal representation. If you need legal representation in most cases, um, personal injury, divorce, family law, uh, trust in estate, you're in some sort of crisis. So. Being someone who is a first responder means that you need to have that that air of empathy and letting people know that you're there for them. So sending messages routinely um, in the case of personal injury, the, the biggest complaint we see is uh, it's taking too long. I haven't heard anything. So I don't know what those, the status is. Right. Get, I want to know the status. So the messaging piece there, you know, if it's just sending a, a, a stock message every, uh, you know, not too automated, you know, you don't want to make it exactly on the 30th of every month, but hey, John, listen, I know waiting is the hardest part. I want you to know we're working hard on your case. And as soon as there's anything to report, I will let you know. Um, and then all the better if you can designate someone actually on your team or at Smith, at Smith to make some of those client care calls to get to know people a little bit. You know, I'm going to share one of my absolute favorite, um, I'm going to show you one of my favorite bits um, from a TED talk that is just fantastic for this moment in time. We are seeing the application of automation freeing up a lot of folks from some of the, uh, some of the uh, mundane tasks that, over, uh, that overwhelm and fill people's plates without having a ton of impact. Where we as attorneys or, or, or intake teams can really have impact is on our delivery of those services. So how do I give people the sense that I'm taking the burden off of them, that I am here to help? And that is the simple care uh, of sometimes just picking up the phone. 
So when you have those conversations and you know who you can turn to, to say, listen, we're growing our practice. Can, would you mind uh, sharing our business card with, with five friends? There's an ice cream uh, coupon on the back. Little things that, that may help you build some of those advocates. The big question though, is how do we make time for this? And that is where automation comes in. Technology and people optimized to create these systems. That's where you have to plug in, create the automations, free up time because things are done repeatedly in the same way every single time. Now, <laughs> you mentioned, you know, where do we, you know, a system for document storage. Well, this is, these are tech solutions for marketing, okay? There are a few of them. And if you are looking for a solution for your firm, having to evaluate all of this is completely overwhelming. Turn to people who know the systems in your space, who have worked with other firms like yours, who can help drive you in the right direction. Because it is hard to make decisions, but if you make the right one, you can really free up a lot of time. Now, this is Tim Lebrecht. He's a, uh, a, a German author. He, Google his TED Talk. He is wonderful. He anticipates, and this is already probably five years old, this TED Talk, I'm guessing. So he's saying in the next 15 years now that the human workforce will be half or half will be replaced by software and automations. And there's actually good news in that. If we use technology and software tools wisely, then we can do the good work of being human. The, the work of providing great service and being empathetic and taking those burdens off of other people, that's where your time should be spent. If you do that, then you are making yourself a go-to firm that someone is gonna say, you're not gonna believe it, my attorney, what he, not only did he do a great job on my case, he actually called me up a couple weeks later to see how I was doing You know, once everything was over. Like that, that's shocking. We need to free up time. It's gotten so saturated and stressful that we need to find ways to build space to be human. Listen to that TED Talk, top five TED Talks ever. Our way of doing that is with Loop. We build in all those automations so that attorneys can do the good work that, that they're doing. It's uh, nurturing those leads, capturing those leads, plugging all that information back into the system, creating these feedback loops so that we know where the best leads are coming from, our best marketing channels, the best place to invest our marketing budget, in increasing the uh, positive interactions with the firm, driving towards uh, high quality reviews, communicating with clients on their phones without having to use your personal cell phone, interacting with referral partners, these are all systems that we build into this one tool. We've done this with firms that are two attorneys. We've done this with firms that are 100 attorneys. Your systems are built to fit your firm. Uh, and that's that, that big piece about being uh, custom versus trying to fit your peg into somebody else's hole. Now, again, backing up for a second. A sustainable firm is largely built on reputation and referrals. It doesn't change, we know that. So how do we make that happen? And that is by closing the loop. We bring leads in, we convert them to clients using those systems that increase our conversions. We free up our time with automation so that we can give great service, build those powerful relationships, create advocates out of our clients, and those advocates will drive business back to the firm. It certainly beats the funnel model where we're just putting money in the top and hoping that new clients come out the bottom and getting back on that treadmill day in and day out. Create a system, this flywheel effect, whereby the energy that you invest in your firm today is going to benefit the firm tomorrow. And that's by serving your clients well. All right. so. Few little, I know we're running tight on time. Uh, this is the inside of Loop. This is the marketing end of it. We're able to evaluate exactly where those high quality leads are coming from, what the conversion rates are looking like so that we can optimize that system to improve it so that every dollar is well spent. Kind of showed you before, creating these pipelines, 
automating the follow-up so you know that those leads are getting those six to nine touch points without you having to do it all yourself or stressing out your intake team, wondering if they got to it all. Entering information, this is my favorite part here, this little notes function here. The accountability is in there. Every interaction is time and date stamped. And then if you finally get that little notification that someone has responded to your automation, you can peek in those notes and see exactly what happened. You're not digging through 42 pages of a notebook. Uh, creating these tasks, again, if you know that the system is going to tell you what to do, you're gonna free up your mental space to do more important things. This little uh, section here is all about scheduling those consultations, ensuring that folks show up to them so you're not wasting your time and they're getting the help that they need. So I know we're tight on time. I do love systems, despite what my husband might say about where I keep the mail or little things that drive him crazy. But I do believe that there is a system that every firm can function in. Uh, and we'd be happy to talk and see if we can help any firm create that system for them. Carrie, I mean, you know, I wish that we had more time to look into your system specifically. I think the benefit will be for everyone to contact you and, you know, talk about their specific needs. But if you go back um, a slide, you know, sure. I, there are a couple of things that I even want to, you know, draw. Absolutely. You go. Uh, yeah. So let's stay at this one for a second. If sure. you don't have this visibility into your sources of new leads and how much money it's bringing in, are they open one? Are they are they lost? What is your win percentage? I mean, this view alone is outstanding. This is so simple. this is the money right here. So you can look back as far as 1922 to John Wanamaker, who said 50% of my marketing isn't working. I'm just not sure which half. This <laughs> is how we know. So we can evaluate this based on the based on what we've put in and, and you know we work with clients in, in consulting capacities marketing capacities and simply on the software so you know when we when you work with us and we put this in one of the great things that we do for our software folks is we still send them that report you're you're only closing four percent of facebook leads that that shouldn't be costing you more than twenty dollars a lead based on based on that data your lead your your case acquisition is higher than 10% of firms in, 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 in a similar market area. Uh, being able to make decisions on your marketing spend is how you will drive down acquisition costs. The market is saturated, the costs are high. You cannot just throw money at it. You need to know what it costs to get a lead, what number of leads you're converting, and, uh, and the value of a case. If you can answer those three questions, then you have just trans transformed marketing from an expense to an investment. I know if I put this much in, I should get this much out. And if you are looking at marketing as an investment, you will grow your firm. 100%. Well, you know, I hope that everyone found this as valuable as I did. Um, thank you all for, for, you know, attending this whole time. And uh, Carrie's contact information, you know, again, uh, was provided on the last slide. Uh, if you receive the email registration, then you'll also get that by email along with the recording, which we will post on YouTube as well. So uh, everyone look forward to uh, a follow up from me. I will post the recording. Absolutely. Yes. And uh, thank you all for your questions for staying around the whole time. And mm -hmm. Harry, the, the biggest thank you to you for, for dropping. And thank you to Smith. Smith is doing a great job making our clients very happy too. So you guys have been a great partner and, um, and we'd be happy to talk with anyone about their systems and uh, we'd love to help. Wonderful. Well, please get in touch with Carrie. Um, you know, she really puts her money where her mouth is. <laughs> and here is to really a, a fantastic month year of progress and growth with strong systems for your firm so. and be human it's a movement it's a movement <laughs> wonderful all right great that's a great you all. thanks great so much for thought. having me thanks gary take all care right. bye-bye